Good morning, almost afternoon. Hopefully everybody got a uh, yellow sticky. Uh, if you didn't, then we'll get one to you. Here's your need a yellow sticky. You get to bring it, you get to take it home too, which is awesome. It's, it's yours to keep. We're going to do a little exercise uh, later on. but So just to preface uh, our talk is that what we've tried to do this year, a little bit different from last year, few years is rather than go through all the psychosocial and behavioral research, which there's a lot of in diabetes, we wanted to kind of collapse all of what we know about psychosocial and behavioral functioning of people with diabetes, specifically kids, and give you some exercises or some uh, ways of better understanding how to manage uh, these kinds of issues. So uh, we'll be interested to hear uh, what you think of this approach. Oops. So I'm at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, and uh, Corey is down at Stanford. We're both clinical researchers as well as clinicians. Uh, collectively, we have about 45 years of experience doing clinical research in this area. So, All right. So bear with me for a minute. I needed a new TV. And so I'm a smart guy, I think. Well, my wife would probably disagree, but in general, I think I'm a smart guy. So I went to Consumer Reports, and I got all the information I needed on the best TV, right? Um, I looked at uh, you know, best buys. I looked at um, reliability. I looked at all those variables. I measured my cabinet. Uh, and then I went to one of the local dealers, and, and uh, I was surprised when I got there. So there were three TVs in front of me. There was the TV that I was going to purchase, right? There was a TV that was probably uh, twice the size of that TV, and that was about, I don't know, $1,200. So the TV I was going to purchase was $300. And then there was a TV that was just a little bit bigger than the one that I was going to purchase, and it was, you guys know where this is going, $325. So for $25 more, I get like five or six more inches of TV, and, um, and a lot more buzzers and bells. So which TV did I walk out with? Yeah. So I had to go shopping for a cabinet. Um, so my wife wasn't uh, too pleased with me. So the moral to the story is, is that we think we are rational beings. We think we make decisions in a rational way. Uh, we think through the pros and cons. We're good problem solvers, right? So decision making is all up here. And what most of us do in terms of making decisions is that we are, what drives our decision making is our emotions. So what I want you to think about is your brain is these two things, a rider and an elephant, okay? The elephant is what you want, right? It's what you want, it's all your emotional energy. The rider is what you think, all right? And so anything that you do in the world, whether it's purchasing a TV, helping manage your child's diabetes, managing your own health issues, investing money, whatever it is, purchasing a home. Um, these two things have to work together. So there's this guy, his name is Jonathan Haidt. It's, he's at the University of Virginia. He wrote a book called The Happiness Hypothesis. And this isn't a new concept of this emotional brain and this rational brain, uh, but he kind of broke it down in, the, in this way. So once again, we have a rational thinking. Information processing theory suggests that we're rational agents. We set goals, we pursue those goals, right? And that we intelligently make decisions. But really, the reality is that our feelings oftentimes dominate um, what we do, when we do, and how we do it. The thing is, though, is that elephants aren't all bad, right? Elephants aren't all bad. They get things done. We need elephants. Um, riders actually can overanalyze things. And they get stuck in, you know, think about all the information we've gotten today. Incredible information. 
incredible information, and there's incredible research going on in diabetes management. But how do you sort through it all? Right? It's like information overload, and what's best for my child? And what's going to work best? And what's really the problem? I mean, Dr. Hirsch's stuff was just incredible, you know? Okay, we have two A1Cs, but we have variability that's different in both. And so trying to understand, well, what's the gold standard? Is it the A1C that I'm supposed to be looking at, or is it something else? So writers just get consumed in information and try to sort it out. It would be much easier if diabetes management was, you do this, and this is the outcome, right? Yeah, no. That's actually the cruel trick of diabetes, because you can do all this, and the outcome could be different each time, right? And this is what your kids have to deal with. So it's kind of a losing game. It's a punishing kind of thing to have to go through. So what I see and what Dr. Hood sees in our clinics can be kind of consolidated down into this, is that we used to think that psychosocial and behavioral burdens of diabetes are enormous and that kids who have diabetes are at higher risk for depression and anxiety and all these things. And I think what we're finding is that that's not necessarily true. What we're finding is that we're asking kids and we're asking families and parents to do something that is um, quite challenging and extraordinary. And when you're in that circumstance, whether you're a parent or a kid trying to meet these demands, uh, it can be exhausting, it can be overwhelming, it can be distressing. I'm not sure I would call that depression. I would call that a normal response to an extraordinary circumstance. That's what I see it as. So when I'm in clinic working with patients, what our docs and nurses see as resistance, I see as exhaustion, right? Or lack of clarity, I'm sorry. Lack of clarity. So the rider doesn't know which direction to go. Think about the last two hours of information. Where is the rider supposed to head the elephant? Right? What direction are we supposed to take here? What path? What path is best? I think um, Dr. Hirsch said it best is that no diabetes is the same in any person, in any two people, right? And so how do you know which direction to take? That doesn't mean they're resistant. It just means we got a lot of information, we got a lot of different paths, and we're just doing our best to manage this. Then I see a lot of Good intending docs and parents thinking their kids are lazy. Lazy is not a trait. There's no such thing as lazy, right? There is nothing that comes from being lazy. So things that get reinforced are things that are traits. But there's nothing reinforcing about being lazy. Most kids get a lot of grief for not doing what either the doctors are telling them or the nurses are telling them. So instead of laziness, I see exhaustion. Think about your rider. Think about all the decisions you have to make as a rider in the day. Then add diabetes decision making on top of that. I don't know about you, but I don't have diabetes. I'm exhausted after the end of a day. I don't do manual labor, right? I see patients, I do research, and it's exhausting. I mean, I come home and I'm just exhausted. And that's because my rider is having to make constant decisions about this and that, right? analyzing situations, problem solving. OK, now let's take diabetes on top of that. So my rider's working overtime, and then I'm standing in front of a vending machine, and then my rider has to engage about what do I buy, what do I not buy, right? Is it, what's my blood sugar like? And so your kids are doing the same thing. They're managing, the rider is constantly managing their school day, their peer relations, everything else, and then you superimpose diabetes on it, and you've got just exhaustion. So shaping the path, sometimes the writer doesn't know which way to go, right? And oftentimes people think of, it's a person problem, it's my kid's problem. Really? It's a situation problem that I see. It's not your kid's problem. I would guess that all of your children want to be healthy. There's nothing in it for them to not be healthy, right? And so. I don't see it as the problem lying within the individual. I see it as we have a situation problem, and we don't have the right things in place to help shape the path and to direct somebody through that maze of a lot of information. And then finally, 
the last piece of helping elephants and riders work together, you have got to feed your elephant. You've got to feed the elephant. So what does that mean? All right? So you're sitting, so you don't have diabetes. You're sitting on the couch. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden, you get hungry. And you're watching infomercials or whatever reruns of Seinfeld. And you know you have ice cream in the, refriger or in the freezer. And you're on a diet. And your rider is saying, don't do it. And the elephant just gets up off the couch and starts heading to the freezer. <laughs> and the rider is just pulling the reins, right, on that elephant. And the elephant's just like, you know, good luck, pal. <laughs> and then you get the ice cream, and you sit down, and the rider's still working overtime trying, okay, let's just go for, you know, a couple scoops here. And the elephant starts eating. It's like, ooh, this is good, right? So how do you manage those two competing things of trying to do what's rational, what's based on information, and then what you want, what you like? And so what we encourage and what I do in clinic is encourage parents to not just look at the information and what the doctors are telling them to do, but what does the child want and how can we dose out Small wins, small feeds to the elephant, right? You guys hopefully do this. It's a moment in time, right? So when I see a parent get really nervous when a child's, you know, not giving insulin for, you know, a piece of cake or something, it's a moment in time because a parent takes that moment in time and it becomes an eternity. It becomes their life. It becomes complications. It becomes an A1C that's elevated. It's a moment in time, okay? And so we're reducing the importance of each little thing that young people do to manage their diabetes. We're reducing the importance. We're reducing the demands, right? And we're increasing the chances that they can do this. Because how do you feel when you're on a diet and the elephant is plowing through a quart or a gallon or a half a gallon of ice cream? You feel totally helpless and like you can't do anything. And this is how your children feel when they're working overtime and they come into clinic and their A1C is elevated, right? And so they just want to give up. And so you, you have got to give them small wins. You have got to give them a sense that I can do this. Otherwise, they will be overwhelmed by their diabetes and be distressed. So small wins breed big change. That's the bottom line. People, some of the docs that I work with think I'm crazy that I'll see a kid who's maxing out their A1C at 14% and have for the past two years, and when they come into the clinic, I thank them for coming in. Why are they, if they don't care, why are they in the clinic, right? I think that's a win. It also means that they're overwhelmed by the challenges of their diabetes, and so I gotta figure out a way for them to feel like they're winning at this game. You're here, that's awesome. And guess what, you're here and you've been losing this game for two years. And that means that you're still in the game, right? Or kids who are still giving insulin even though their A1C is maxed out. Why do you give insulin? Well, because they wanna be healthy. And so that's a win, that's a win. These are immediate to reach, right? So I think of a child looking at the diabetes regimen as climbing Mount Everest and looking up at the top and that's what the docs want, that's what we want. Right? That's what parents want, and that just seems overwhelming. And so we do this climb, right? base camp, and move up a little bit, and move up a little bit. And so that's much more manageable. And ultimately, the payoff is at the end. Okay, so probably guessed by now I'm not a really touchy-feely psychologist. Um, I don't know what gave it away, but I love this exercise. And bear with me, I want you all to, if you are comfortable doing it, I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but I want you to take your sticky note, all right? And I want you to hold it as far away from you as it possibly can get. And just keep it there. Push it as far away as you can, right? Just keep holding it. What are you noticing? 
Your arm getting tired? Yeah. What else are you noticing? How much of your attention is paid to that sticky note right now? Too much. Yeah, too much. So this is diabetes, right? And this is what a lot of young people, as well as adults, do with diabetes, is it's out here, it's out here. So you're trying to push it away, right? And what ultimately happens is it does the opposite. It has your full attention, and it's fatiguing. So what's your option now? Right? How do you feel now? Better. Right? Better. So this is one of the things both of us see in the clinic a lot, is this fighting with diabetes. It's not going anywhere. You can't get it far enough away from you. Right? You can push it out as far as you want. It's not going anywhere. And ultimately, that effort, most, most things, if you fight with it, it's actually a pretty adaptive thing. But in chronic illness and in diabetes, it's not adaptive at all, right? And so what's your other option? Your other option is to bring it in, bring it closer. Then it becomes less of a burden, ultimately, right? It's less fatiguing, and it's not a focus of you. But it is you. That's the bottom line. It's not going anywhere. So I think of this as psychological quicksand. What do they tell you to do in quicksand? Increase your surface area with the sand and stay still. Right? That's counterintuitive because the quicksand is pulling you, and so your, your intuitive mind says, get out. Right? If you increase your surface area, you bring it in close. Right? You have more touch points with diabetes. And then it stops pulling you down. Does this make sense to y'all? So keeping diabetes at a distance is akin to fighting with it. And that's what we see a lot of psychologically is not depression and anxiety, but fighting with this thing that overwhelms them. And typically the fight doesn't go well, even in the best patients, right? And so diabetes starts fatiguing people. It overwhelms them. And the consequence is, is you're fighting for your life. You're not living your life. Because you're constantly diabetic. That's your focus. So, and abandoning the fight is counterintuitive. Because once again, remember what I said, the fight in most situations is very, very adaptive. But in things like diabetes that aren't going to go anywhere and that you're never going to win, it's, it's not helping. So I say abandon the fight. Help your children learn how to abandon the fight. And so how do you do that? You increase the surface area with diabetes, more touch points. This is an example. More touch points, right? And more touch points that aren't punishing. What's the most punishing touch point that a young person has with diabetes? Clinic, right? Because they come in and it's, how are you doing? And they look at the A1C. And that reminds them that they're losing a game, right? How many people are under target or at target? I, I, I'm just baffled. I mean, our A1C mean is 8.8, .8, and most clinics across the country are just like that. Not even close to what 7.5 or under that it's supposed to be. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hood. Thanks, um, and it's actually a really nice segue into um, um, this slide because, and I think that a couple of the, uh, it's not supposed to say QUI on there, it's supposed to say quicksand, but <laughs> the, uh, I think there was some change in the upload. But this is not your kid with diabetes. They're not made up, they're not defined, they're not, their outline isn't numbers. They're people first, your kids first, I'm a person with type 1 diabetes first, and then I'm not defined by my numbers. And I think that this is one of our biggest areas of potential quicksand. And as Michael was talking um, about this, um, you know, my sticky note fell off, and then it got stuck to my foot, and I'm trying to, you know, <laughs> kick diabetes off. But, you know, you end up feeling that way a lot of times. 
And so part of what we wanted to do today was just to talk about, in addition to what you've already heard, just some other ways that, that we've learned that can be helpful for avoiding this quicksand and potentially um, helping you to thrive or feel like you're thriving in life with diabetes. So just a, in addition to, um, so I've had type 1 diabetes for 15 years, and um, I, yesterday was my 15-year anniversary. Um, oh, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just going to end there. That was a good, <laughs> but, um, but what is burned deeply into my brain is that 15 years ago, I was at the University of Florida student clinic, and and I, this is after months of losing weight, going to the bathroom all the time. I'd lost about 35 pounds before I was diagnosed. And, you know, the woman, in, in her defense, I, I'm not sure that she dealt with a lot of young adults diagnosed with type 1. And she was like, I, I think you probably have diabetes. And, you know, my blood sugar was reading high on the meter. And she gave me a shot of regular and sent me home. And so the next day, I went in for my endocrinologist visit, which happened to be on my birthday, because today's my birthday, and you don't have to applaud for that. But the, um, so all of these things kind of tie up nicely for me, because you know, 15 years and having type 1, and it's close to my birthday. So I always remember these things. They're kind of burned into my brain. But it's also, it, it also helps me each year kind of reflect and to push myself. Like, what do I want to accomplish in this next year? And so... Um, hopefully, as we go through a few more slides, you'll see in some ways that I try and challenge myself around this. So the, the, when I think about the first, or you know, before I had type 1 diabetes, when I look back, I kind of think about that as easy living. You know, it was relative to the ups and downs of the last 15 years, I mean, it was relatively easy. Um, you know, the last 15 years, I've had days like this on my CGM where it's a nice, flat line. I, I do have days like this. I have days like this, too. <laughs> and you saw the slide earlier from Dr. Hirsch's talk. Dr. Pragnell talked about um, glycemic variability as well. Um, this happens a lot. And this, isn't, this doesn't mean that I'm a bad person. This doesn't mean that your kids are bad people, that you're bad parents. This happens. And I can... I can with 100% confidence tell you I have no idea why some of these things happen. So some days I can figure it out, but other days it's things like this and it's really hard to figure out. So you know, the, the title of our presentation was about dealing with these highs and lows, and it's not just the highs and lows that, that physically happen, it's the highs and lows of riding this roller coaster of, of diabetes management. <clears throat> So for me, what, what's helped me and what is consistent with this, uh, what Dr. Harris was talking about with this rational versus kind of emotional thinking is I've had to develop a personal, professional relationship with type 1 diabetes. And that's one of the things that's helped me um, live with type 1 and continue to thrive and also pushed me in a position where um, I'm able to potentially maybe have some more passion about my work, which focuses a lot on um, device use and technology and the human factors involved in all of these different systems and technologies that you're hearing about. So what are the lessons learned? So this is a combination of my own experiences as well as what the evidence base tells us, and it also reflects some of the points that Dr. Harris was making. So what are the lessons learned in living with diabetes? It's a fair amount of science and art. Um, to think about it as all science and that there's no art to this, I think you put yourself in a tough position because, as many of you know, um, and uh, Dr. Harris mentioned this earlier, that you know, what you do on one day, it can be the same exact thing that you do the next day, and you have different outcomes. And that's frustrating, and it can be a tricky um, process that what you if you just rely on the science of it and it should predict and should go this one way, you end up in a position of being frustrated and annoyed. So there is a certain amount of art and your own type 1 diabetes, you guys are experts in your child's or your own or your family's type 1 diabetes. I think it's, it's quite humbling. Um, and part of it is what we just talked about is that those rises and falls 
and not being able to get it exactly right or that I should have done it a certain way, or I need to do it a certain way, you realize that using those words and thinking that way, it can be really deflating. And sometimes it can be rather humbling because you're not always um, the, the excellent rider that you would like to be. I've also learned that, and I think this is helpful, and this is one of the things that we talk with teens about, with young kids, with parents, um, young adults, we talk about getting support the way that you like it. And what that means is that if you are, um, if you're somebody who likes help with problem solving and you say to your partner, um, you know, I'm really frustrated by this, you know, I don't know what to do. And they offer some solutions to the problems, that's great. But many times when we go to somebody to complain about something, we just want someone to listen. And so often you have to tell people the kind of support that you want from them. So if you start a conversation with your partner or you start a conversation with your kid, say what you want to happen. And if you don't want them to solve a problem for you, say, I just want you to listen. I don't want you to solve the problem. So what I found is looking for support around diabetes, you have to find, you have to do it in the way that is the best fit for you. But you have to get support. You can't do this alone. You know, we've, you've heard from a, a number of um, presenters today, and then um, you know, one of the best things about having type 1 is just meeting the amazing people that I've gotten to, to work with, and the families, and going to camp, and hanging out with the kids. All of those things I think of as um, a positive side to this. Now, certainly, like, I would elbow and push all of you out of the, the way if there was a booth for the cure outside. <laughs> Um, I would be the first one there, but while I have it, it, it has generated a certain amount of access to amazing people and amazing experiences, and so sometimes thinking about it that way and those kind of small wins, wow, I just got to meet this person, and this person talked to me about this. So thinking about it sometimes in that way can be really helpful. It's tiring. I mean, how many of you were able to go to sleep last night at 10 o'clock and get up at 6.30 this morning? Anybody sleep through the night last night? No. It doesn't happen. And so that contributes. The lack of sleep, the changes in sleep certainly makes you more tired. But it's also a chronic condition that you have to constantly think about and be aware of. And at times I feel like, you know, I'm ready for a break. I just like to not think about this for a certain number of hours. And, you know, the work that's going on with artificial pancreas and we're involved in, um, one of the things that, that I do at Stanford is, is help build in human factors assessments, and we run focus groups with, with individuals participating in these artificial pancreas trials. And some of them talk about, I didn't have to think about, I knew the system was working when I went to bed at night, and I woke up at 1.20, and I felt so great. I mean, the, the overnight, I think, is already there and we're still working on the day. But think about even stretching at four or six or 10 hours, how, much, how nice that would be to be able to check out for those periods of time. You're not gonna be able to check out for days and weeks on end, but you're gonna be able to check out for longer periods of time. And they're gonna to continue to improve and improve to where we can actually do that. Technology, you know, I, I'm someone who uses a pump and continuous glucose monitoring and share my data and download and all of those things. So for me, it's, it's something that's really helpful, but it doesn't have to be for you. There, there are some great tools, but they're, that's what they are. They're tools. And so you also have to forge a relationship with those new tools, and they have to be a right fit for your family. So if you're interested in them, if you're interested in devices and technologies, advocate for it. If you're not, that's okay. And don't feel peer pressured to do it. So the, the, Michael and I were talking about this um, a little bit. And one of the things that for me, you know, I have to challenge myself. I have to find some ways to, to keep pushing because it, it has to stay fresh in some ways. And I have to find some way to kind of push through. And it also is it's consistent with this idea of the sticky note. You know, there are times when it's just glaring out there and my arm's getting tired, I'm seeing it, there's so much attention on it. And so for me, challenging myself and committing my attention to something else can often 
be helpful. So I was going to talk a little bit about the Boston Marathon. I ran with the JDRF team um, in 2014, and this was the, the team the morning before we headed out. And, you know, the, it was a great experience, and I was fortunate to be involved in the team. And our team of, I think, 29 individuals raised $335,000 for the New England chapter of JDRF. And, you know, for whatever, you know, whatever, whether it was someone donating $5 or $500 or $5,000, everybody was in it for the same purpose. And you saw um, in the Dr. Pragnell's um, presentation just the, the range of um, efforts and dedication and dedicated monies that go into um, this work. And so I know that when I do this and when I participate in it and when you do this and you go to the walk and when you're a volunteer, you're contributing to the mission. And um, whether you want to put more of your, your mission investment in a cure and encapsulation and restoration and the artificial pancreas, that's up to you to where you want to dedicate your interest. But for me, this was some way that I could challenge myself and, and divert the attention from diabetes being out here all the time. So we did, so in preparation, we had a team and I was running largely on my own being out in California and the team was, uh, many of them were in New England, but we would run the same kind of you know, if we were doing a 14-mile run, we'd kind of do it in the same way in the same weekends and things like that. So I did about 460 training miles, um, 70 hours of running, and then the day of, like, you still have to run 26.2 <laughs> miles. I had kind of forgotten that. I was like, I can just show up, right? This is going to be fine. So then this is me winning. Oh, wait, no. Um, that wasn't me winning. Um, that was me completely, yeah. So anyway, but, um, I was a few hours behind Meb, who won, but uh, we did finish. Uh, everybody on the team finished, and we had a really great experience, and we had time afterward together to kind of celebrate those, those small victories, those small wins, because it was a huge lead-up to it. And so finishing meant that you accomplished something. So, and this is a picture, uh, you know, with my JDRF shirt on, and um, I wasn't, you know, sprinting, so I had time to stop and say hello to several people <laughs> along the way. Um, this was about halfway through, and my wife and one of my good friends and uh, my daughter were there, and so it was kind of nice to stop in the middle of it and say hi to people. So, so with that, so... So I, the point of mentioning that is partly to say, like, this is how I challenge myself. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do it in that way. But find ways to challenge yourself around diabetes. But one of the other things that reminds me of is that still, when you do everything the right way, you set yourself up, you do all the training, it doesn't always go the way that you want. So I ran. I had high blood sugar at the beginning, probably a bit from adrenaline and being worked up in the, the environment. I did everything the way, you know, I cut my basil at the time I wanted to. I had this, I woke up at 4 a.m. to eat so that I'd have insulin clearing my system by the time I started. I did all of those things. It was a little bit warmer. I got dehydrated, I think, early because of a couple of things. I didn't eat carbs because my blood sugar was high, which then contributed to um, the, you know, creating problems with dehydration and insulin infusion. So I was pouring in insulin, and it wasn't absorbing, and I kept pouring in, pouring in, pouring in insulin. And I ended up developing ketones, which isn't, you know, isn't all that surprising given this. And, and people who just run marathons without type 1 diabetes also can develop ketones. It's not something that is just because of diabetes, but that didn't help. Um, so I ended up, you know, a few hours later, and I was throwing up, and I had, um, you know, was reading 3.2 on the ketone meter, the blood meter, and so we had to do a few things, you know, and fortunately, I, um, one of my, uh, my um, research mentor and um, one of my um, colleagues at the Joslin, Dr. Lori LaFell, you know, she's on speed dial, and so we were talking, and she kind of walked us through what to do, and so everything worked out, and I'm here, and everything was fine, but it, you know, it's those kind of things that then push me to kind of go back to this idea of, you know, I really still want to get back to this easy living. 
you know, I like that, I had a great experience, but I still want to get back to that easy living. And so for me, I invest time in um, other ways, and I challenge myself in thinking about you know, this, this human side of technology and devices and trying to make sure that when people start on closed loop systems, that they're actually going to use them and they're going to sustain use. And so we're, we, we do a number of things in terms of trying to understand personality characteristics and distress levels and burden and anxiety and all of those things so that when people start on this, that we can actually train them in the right way, provide education, and then also provide ongoing support. So that's some of the work that we're doing. I work closely with Dr. Bruce Buckingham at Stanford, and um, we are, you know, we're all constantly thinking about ways to improve these systems and improve the uptake. So for me, that's something that is really important, and I think about it as because you know, we're humans, and we're using machines, um, and what is the interface between the information that's coming in and what we're thinking, and it goes back to the rider and the elephant. And you know, we have to improve our riding skills as we work with all these different machines. So I was just going to note a couple. You heard a little bit about this earlier. But um, you know, these systems are being tested. There are probably hundreds of people using do-it-themselves do systems around the world. Um, so these people are, are wearing these systems and using them. And then there are thousands of people in clinical trials using these systems around the world. This is one from uh, the University of Virginia group, Boris Kovacs' group, and one of the earliest versions of it, and it's, it's evolved. There are new generations with different devices and technologies. But again, you saw, um, I think maybe in um, Dr. Greenbaum's uh, talk, there were a couple of different slides, but you, know, you can now have a you know, a, a receiver that's a smartphone size that takes and integrates all of this information. And using a connection between continuous glucose monitoring and insulin pumping. So these, these systems continue to evolve and get better. And there are ongoing um, trials about these studies. We also, the team at Stanford, you know, we've done a, a number of studies in camps. and you can achieve um, great overnight glucose control with these systems. And you also can prevent severe hypoglycemia. You can predict when it's going to happen and prevent it from happening. And then, um, as Dr. Pragnell was noting, I was just going to highlight this, that you know, this is a really important um, point where we're thinking about what's next and what are the pathways that we're going to go down related to the artificial pancreas. And so I encourage you to find this article, read through it, and to think about, you know, as you saw earlier, some of these different paths and where we're at on those. And I, I mentioned that partly because I think it's really important as a person, um, as a family affected by type 1 diabetes, to think about where you want, if this is what you're passionate about, you know, identify some part of it and push on it and learn about it and push the investigators and talk about it and raise money if that's what you're interested in doing around those areas. Because you can't do it all. There is a whole buffet of, area of things that you could work on. And so thinking about what you're interested in, what you're passionate about, and using your resources for that can help you, you, know, you know, keep diabetes closer so that it's not consuming all of your attention. So in conclusion, um, you know, Dr. Harrison, I thought about a, a few different areas, and I just kind of highlighted this, but you know, find your passion and do what you can to think about your relationship with diabetes as personal, professional relationship. Okay? It's not just a personal um, relationship. You have to have some professional part of it, um, a little bit more business-like, because otherwise the emotional side of it is going to take over. This, this idea of you know, diabetes quicksand and you know, going back to that image of the person defined by numbers, um, don't let yourself fall into these um, potential areas of psychological and diabetes quicksand. So watch out for those indicators and cues that it might be coming up. And keep your eye on this idea. For, for me, it, that's, you know, it's, 
easy living. I don't know if that's right, but that's just what resonates in my brain. For you guys, think about what, what, is, the, what is it that you're working toward? And so you have to think about these small wins and small goals and small investments, but it's all working toward some um, long-term goal that you have for your, yourself or for your family. And again, I think that you know, asking questions, don't be shy about asking questions, pushing researchers. Um, if you need to do it yourself, do it yourself. And push and push and push because you know, there, are, there are a number of people that are working on these areas and, um, and you should trust that people are working hard and investing time and energy and money. But also, it's okay to keep pushing and keep pushing us to continue to improve and to continue to invest and continue to grow these systems. So with that, I want to say thank you, and I think that we, we have a little bit of time for questions. So. Thank you, Dr. Hood and Dr. Harris. And we do have some time for questions, if there are any. Question over here. When a child has diabetes and they're constantly doing this with their blood sugars, no matter how hard as a parent we try, can that affect them as far as, like, they're saying my son has ADHD. Can that, because his blood sugars are constantly doing this to this to this, can that be an effect for him, to, you know, where they're saying it's ADHD, but it's really not? It's because his blood sugars are so crazy. So we've done some, uh, some research on ADHD and diabetes, and uh, I don't know this answers your question, um, and I'm not sure I'm the authority to, to answer that question, uh, but what we see is that ADHD that co-occurs with diabetes just compounds the problem exponentially. Because as you know, having the ability to organize, have forethought, right, not be impulsive, um, are all qualities that people who have executive functioning difficulties like ADHD uh, just make it really hard to, to manage diabetes. Whether the, the diabetes is um, causing or a manifestation of ADHD, I don't know the answer to that. I do know that um, people don't feel really good when they're high a lot and it's hard to concentrate, um, but there's a lot of other component parts of ADHD that um, shouldn't be connected to diabetes like impulsivity and hyperactivity and those kinds of things. But certainly attention and concentration are probably linked to, to blood sugars. And I think the, the, the point around distress <coughs> and de depression was more that um, it's not that there wouldn't be symptoms that if you look at the you know, criteria for what, how you would call somebody de depressed or to have you know, anxiety, it's not that you wouldn't see some of those symptoms in people with type 1 or people with diabetes in general, or maybe even you see more of them in people with diabetes versus people without, but that maybe it's not you know, a, um, a psychological, psychiatric diagnosis as much as, as it is as a normal response to the burden and to, to living with this. So it doesn't mean that you don't do something about it, but the way that you treat it is probably a little bit different than, than you would if it was just a classic case of depression or distress. So. Yeah, so I, um, I would totally agree with Corey is that we see a lot of young people whose parents and uh, uh, PCPs have identified them as having depression. And so then from there, if they consider it just depression, then they send them off for traditional mental health services, whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy or something like that, or even medication. Like Corey said, it's not something, it's not that we wouldn't do anything about it, but that's not what we would do about it. If it's really driven by having diabetes and the challenges that come with diabetes, then that would change how we would treat it. Question here in the front. Well. It's a lot of how we've talked today is the focus is on figuring out a way to um, increase your touch points and surface area with diabetes without you know, getting away from the fight because the fight is the thing that brings on symptoms of depression or what you may see as distress in your child. So it's not something that you know, I, you know, okay. we would 
say we could talk about right now because it's what we do for a living, um, but there are professionals in the community that actually have the skills to know how to help a young person um, shift their level of distress around their management. And, and we might start with something that's more um, diabetes specific around problem solving. So we might teach them a, you know, some steps about how to solve problems that are largely diabetes related. So every day this is what comes up. So you know, we identify the problem, we teach, you know, we brainstorm about solutions, we come up with several different ones, <laughs> we implement one, we evaluate whether it works in a short time frame, a week or two, and then we try and edit it, you know, adjust it as needed. So you might start with that approach before you go down the path of, you know, more intensive talk therapy or an antidepressant medication. I think that I'm, we're, I think we're both big proponents of the least invasive treatment to start, and then if those things fail or they don't have the full benefit, it's also, it also clarifies what potentially the diagnosis is, but it also then you can step up. Whereas if you go full tilt, it's, it's hard to pull back. So Another example of something very simple that you can do if you don't already do it, we do it in our center, um, and it addresses the rider and elephant issue is that we say there's no such thing as a bad blood sugar. So we take away that negative valence that's attached to those numbers, Blood sugars aren't good and bad, they're information. So we appeal to the rider, not the elephant on this. We take away kind of the emotional drain that comes with seeing a 500 or seeing a 350 after working really hard, right? And so it's information. So what we say, and um, uh, Dr. Uh, Weisberg Benchel is at Lurie Children's in Chicago, he says, coaches parents to say thank you after every blood sugar. So it changes the whole complexion of managing diabetes. You're thanking them for the behavior. The number itself is information that's really good, and so it tells us what we need to do. If it's a 500, then we need to know what to do. I'm glad it's a 500, because then I, I, I'm glad I know. So our line is there's only one time that we consider a blood sugar bad. It's the one that wasn't taken. I don't know what to do without a number, right? And so just that simple conversation as a parent um, with your child can shift a little bit of the emotional negative valence that's attached to the diabetes distress. So along those uh, lines, if your child is um, coming home from school, his blood sugar like spiked to 380 in the middle of the day, and I wanna say, you know, why did that happen? In, not, in just an information way, mm -hmm. how would you phrase that? How do you think? In well, a way where I should say, you know, what do you think happened to make you have a 380 so we can yeah. figure out how to fix it or change it? So I, I, think that, I think that what I, I would ask those questions in a similar way, but I'd wait five minutes and I'd ask them about how their day was. Did you do anything fun? Did you have, like, you know, what did you do around, you know, the assembly that you had today or what did you think about this? So have a conversation about them as a person, <clears throat> as a kid first, and then you can say, you know, I noticed that your blood sugar is, you know, 380. Like, can you think back about, um, you know, was it something that you ate? What do you think, you know, caused that? And so you can start to link that up, and I think that that's a perfectly reasonable conversation to have, but don't let it be the featured conversation that you have. So, and, and he, he, may not have any clue um, why that is. But most of the time, there's, it's probably some extra snacking. I mean, we, we know that you know, some extra snacking or that you know, maybe a little bit of, of nervousness about going to the nurse or you know, he's really involved in some other activity and doesn't want to take the time to make sure that it's the right amount of insulin. So there's a lot of really good reasons. Um, and I think it's perfectly reasonable to ask those information gathering questions. So. I would also add that um, the first thing I do is exactly what Corey said, is ad address non-diabetes related issues. And then if you need to deal with the blood sugar, once again, this is good. We know what it is. Then we need to make some changes. I would also add that when I'm, when I'm coaching p parents to talk about the diabetes management and deciding what's driving that, I would always do a menu approach and I would throw in, do you think it's just one of those days where it doesn't matter what you did, right? So it's this, 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 it's instead of going towards the first thing, which is let's figure out what happened. 
what did you do? We already know and we agreed as a group that it's not a one-to-one -one relationship between what you do and what happens. And so why not include that in the discussion right away, right? Probably got time for one last question here in the middle of the room. And we'll, and we'll also be hanging out a little bit. If you, have, if you didn't get to ask your question, we'll be around. You can ask us later. So it's actually more of just sharing. My son is uh, now in sixth grade. He was diagnosed at 18 months. And as we've gone through the journey, he's been taking more and more of the lead in it. And like situations with school, um, he has snack boxes in the classroom. And when I just check in with him and Sometimes you get the weird numbers, and I say, well, I trust your judgment. And we play the games at home, you know, what do you think your blood sugar is, and how do you want to handle this? And just empowering him during the journey, yeah, sounds good. I trust your judgment. Or, you know, we, knowing that he has the support and you're working as a team, but I really think him feeling more and more empowered has really been helpful. So. Very good. And one, great perspective. Yeah. One, Go ahead. Yeah. One thing that, that I always remind people of is that so development is a rose in water. So as parents, teachers, coaches, that's the water. We nurture that rose. But the petals open at their own rate, and each petal is different. So you have cognitive development, you have physical development, emotional development. What we as parents sometimes go to, and I do this myself, I don't, my children don't have diabetes, but I, I go to the same thing as, well, they're smart and they get it. So their cognitive development is intact. Managing diabetes is not a cognitive task alone. It is a psychological, social, emotional task as well. And so you could have a child who totally gets it, right? But they're managing in a social world where there's things that maybe move them away from better management or move them towards better management. And so I think that's a trap you want to be careful of. And it, it sounds like you're, you're um, very sensitive to that and understanding that, once again, just because your child gets it, doesn't mean that they can do it, right? Uh, try something sometime. So <clears throat> go out, if you go out with friends, you have a group of you, watch what the first person orders. Watch what the first person orders, and I guarantee you the last person, their order will closely approximate the first, and this is what I mean. So if you're out with friends, if the first person doesn't order a drink, an alcoholic drink, for that last person to order the alcoholic drink, it gets exponentially harder, <laughs> right? <laughs> Or the first person orders a cheeseburger, and you're the last person, and you go, oh, thank God, right? Instead of, I'll take the salad, <laughs> right? So we're bright, we get it, we understand the importance of taking care of our health, but we live in a social world, and the social world has social control. And that's an example of social control where your children are having to make decisions based on these things, and they have to do it with diabetes, which is not easy. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Hood and Dr. Harris. Thank you.